Well, good morning to you all. Good to see each one. It's been uh, quite a while since I preached out of the, the book I'm going through. It's it's First Corinthians, if you remember. And uh, yeah, I just didn't take my turn for a while. So you're maybe you're. How many would happen to remember what we talked about last time? Out of the first chapter. It's been pretty long, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um, hold you to it. But remember the uh well maybe I'll do this and this will help you remember. Do you remember the word you remember the word uh little word game I did? Definition of um remember this. Uh let's see how to do this. Or uh let's see I went uh no. Uh these aren't English if if you pick that up. Uh what was the other one I okay, I did this. Uh now does anybody remember Maybe anybody remember the definition I put with those words? Any of them? So that that was one of the words I used. That was uh, so this here. So we this here word, just simply love. We'll say this is uh, wise wisdom, and this was fool. When Jesus said, don't say to your brother, you, you moron, the, you fool, it actually means, or a stupid person. Okay, so I said, what does the word philosopher mean? You take those two words, and you, you take, um, so you have philos, and so philosopher, and it means a lover of wisdom, right there. So that's an easy way to remember the word philosopher means a lover of wisdom. And, I, and you all might say, well, we're all lovers of wisdom here, right? So we're all philosophers, is that how it is? But I want to make a little distinction there. That'll be later. Then I use the word Mel, the word Mel uh, brought up just, just to kind of make a point. Um, and it's the word sophomore. So I think the last time I had Whoever is a sophomore, raise your hand. Now they're not going to want to do it. It's it's the second year of a four-year program, so it's usually in high school, and they're usually around 16 years old. They're sophomore, and I'm pretty sure we... Like, say, you're going to raise your hand? I think we have some, or you or you won past that. Anyway, so so what it is is a sophomore is he's this and this so he's essentially a wise fool and that you can find that in the dictionary it is it is factual and you you kind of have this learning under your under your belt and you but not a lot of experience and you, you really think you've got a few things few things down but you're just a wise fool. And then I brought that verse out in Romans that says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so just a little reminder. We looked at wisdom. And now, incidentally, in the second chapter of Corinthians, Paul goes... He continues the, uh, the topic of wisdom. And I try to give a balanced view. You know, we're not, we're, not, we're not hating on wisdom. We are actually, each one of us here, I would say, desires wisdom. And that's a good desire. We should desire wisdom. But I think the key to understanding what Paul is trying to say in the first chapter and here in the second chapter is this. And, and, I'll, and I'll 
and I'll pull another passage out of the Bible to, uh, to make this point. It is, it is that the Bible makes a distinction between man's wisdom and, I, and I'll say uh, wisdom, and these terms come from the Bible, man's wisdom and the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God, or as James says, the wisdom that is from above. And I, and I used that verse last time. So understanding the difference between the two is, is the key to understanding this passage. And so before we go into chapter 2, I would like to read to you James 3, verses 13 to 17. And pay close attention to the definition of wisdom here. James 3, 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? That's a question. I didn't read it as a question. That's a question. Let him show out of a good conversation his work with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, and you could almost put quotations around that, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy hypocrisy so you see the difference he says and, and the and i just like to point out um in verse 13 i believe it is who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you and the thing that caught my eye was let him show out of a good conversation his work with meekness of wisdom so James is pointing out here that this wisdom, and this, is, this would be the, the wisdom from above, the, the uh, godly wisdom, this wisdom includes action. A good, let him show out of a good conversation, or you could say a good life. Good life, good deeds. And so that kind of, caught my attention it's not just brilliant thoughts not just brilliant you know we we have this fascination with with brilliant people or I do I think if you're human and but sometimes it's just a lot of brilliant words brilliant thoughts and what do we have out there on our sign uh, your your walk, whoever puts a sign out there, your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And so that's, that's a, a point James was trying to make. This wisdom is not just a bunch of brilliant ideas. It has action to it. Okay. So one other example before we get into our passage. Old Testament example. First Kings 3, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask what I shall give you. Remember that? Solomon was uh, chosen to lead his people. God said, ask what I shall give you. Uh, verse 9 in chapter 3 said, Solomon said, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern, discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this so great a people. So Solomon didn't say the word wisdom. You know, we always say Solomon asked for wisdom, which he essentially did. Um, but it said this speech pleased the Lord. And then it's a great definition of wisdom. The Lord replies in verse 12 and says, Lo, I have given you a wise and an understanding heart. So wisdom given from God to Solomon, wisdom from above. Um, and, and what did Solomon ask for again? 
an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. Wisdom. Okay. So turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul sticks with this idea a little bit. I'm going to read verses 1 to 5. And I originally thought I was going to cover the whole chapter, but that is not going to happen. Uh, You know, we talked a little bit about brothers meeting, and a couple people gave pointers on Sunday school, and I think James gave a few pointers on message, and he was saying, make a couple of points well. And then, of course, I have to preach the next Sunday, so everybody's, <laughs> you can judge me. <laughs> Make it, and, it's, and it's good advice. I'll say it's good advice. Don't try to cover way more than you can ever and, and just try to get through it. Make, make, the, make a couple of points well because it's kind of, it's kind of proven that, that people, you only retain or remember so much. And so... I'll try to do that here. Um, okay, so so verses, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, verses 1 to 5. Let's have a prayer before, before I read this. Father in heaven, I pray that you would be here in our midst. I pray that you would be with me as I, as I speak. Help me to, to accurately um, present your word in the way that is... Um, humble and pleasing to you and god give me wisdom and grace this morning and thank you for your word that you have given to us in jesus name amen reading from the second chapter and i brethren when i came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god for i determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I like to take my title from some phrase in the text. And so I, I chose that one, Jesus Christ and him crucified, because Paul says, I didn't deter- I t- determined not to know anything except this. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we're going to look at that, those ideas there a little bit. So Paul knew, we had, we had discussed this in our introduction to this, to this book, Paul knew the fascination of this culture the city of Corinth and these Greek people to wisdom, to um, maybe being able to debate your your or how do you say that oratory skills, your your communication, or their intellectual abilities, and he knew he knew these people were that way. They put a high priority on that in fact he says in chapter one the jews require a sign and the greeks what do they do they seek after wisdom so he knew that he was aware of that and so he starts here in verse one by saying well when i came to you i well let me read it when i came to you i didn't come with says excellency of speech in this um, in the King James here excellency of speech or wisdom in other words I didn't present the gospel he came to to uh, the first time to to introduce them to the gospel and Jesus Christ I didn't come the way that you people probably would have ha- would have appreciated that I would have come, if you understand what I'm saying, or the way that your culture, what your culture holds in high esteem, which is excellency of speech, good 
good skills in intellect, um, communication, etc. Or in the method set that you would have liked me to come. I didn't come that way. So it's not that Paul was not educated, you know, in the, in the is it the book of Acts? Where is it that says Paul was taught, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which was a, a, a well-respected, a great teacher in that day. So it's not that Paul was, was just, was uneducated or choosing to just be, um, not to know anything. And, when, and I'll try to make that point later if, well, we'll get there. Um, so, I, and I don't even believe I don't even believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that Paul is saying you cannot present the gospel this way. You know, we hear a lot today about being able to make a good argument for the existence of, of Christ or the existence of creation, etc. And I don't think Paul is, is even saying here that you cannot do that. That's not a way that you should present the Bible. I think what he's saying is, I knew going in what you people held in high regard and I determined I'm not going to play that game with this, with this message. And we'll see why later. Um, basically, I'm going to... He didn't try to outsmart them with his God. In other words, yeah, you have all your gods. I have my God. Now I'm going to just be more brilliant with you and prove to you that my God exists and yours don't. And so he said, I'm not going to do that. What did he do instead? Verse 2, what did he do instead? I determined not to know anything except what? While I was with you. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so, not only did he choose not to use a lot of persuasive um, intellectual arguments, he takes, he takes the thing to, and to a bunch of and to a group of intellectual people, even think of, the, think of it in, in our day, you know, maybe on a college campus or, or, or something, group of very intellectual people. He takes the thing about the gospel that is probably one of the most um, maybe despised, you could say, um, or... Uh, what do I want to say? Despise uh, a couple other words that I've thought of. Um, offensive, I wrote down. It could have been, or probably was, one of the more offensive or despised thing about the gospel. And he says, "This is where, this is what I'm going to present. This is where I'm going to camp, and I'm just going to preach this over and over." Jesus Christ and him crucified to this group of, of intellectual people. Now to us, to as Christians right here, this time period, the cross of Christ, we are so used to hearing about it. It, it almost, and it should, it should give us this, I'll say warm, you know, feeling. You know, the cross of Christ is, is almost... It's reverence today. People, people wear it around their neck in the form of jewelry. They, they'll put it in their churches. They'll, uh, you know, we'll sing songs about the cross. Um, people do the sign of the cross, sports figures. You, you see them, um, you know, they, they do something great and we'll do the sign of the cross. Um, so to us, we've heard about the cross all our lives. Now think of, think of these people um, 2,000 years ago. I can assure you that the death of someone on a cross 2,000 years ago was not held in high regard. And you were despised 
you were despised. And it says that in the, in the Old Testament. If you died this death, you were despised, you were rejected by society, and you were the scum of the earth. If you died on a cross, you were a worse kind of, the worst kind of criminal. And so not only was crucifixion tremendously um, torturous and painful, it was also designed to bring about absolute humiliation to the person. And so, so much so that you've probably heard this before, the Romans, the Romans were not allowed to use that kind of punishment on one of their own citizens, if that's factual. I've heard, about, I've heard that. And so this, quote, I'll say offensive message is what Paul chose to focus on with these intellectual people. So he didn't give them... He didn't engage them in, their, in all their arguments. Um, does this mean that all forms of, of knowledge and uh, understanding is useless? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's what Paul's saying. I think what he's trying to say here is, is to, in, this, in this verse is, my focus is not going to be, not getting into all the weeds and all the, the places where these intellectual um, uh, arguments can take you. I'm, my focus is going to be singular with these people. It's going to be Jesus Christ and him crucified. And um, so that's, uh, that's what he did. That's verse 2. And we'll see why. Like I said, um, there's a quote from a, from a Bible teacher that that um, David Gusick, I believe his name is. It's what you draw, what you draw people with, is what you draw them to. What you draw people with is what you draw them to. And so Paul knew that if he used what they held in high regard, which was intellect, all the things I've mentioned, if he used that to draw these people to the gospel, that's what they were going to be drawn to, his wisdom. And so that's why he says down in verse 5 what he does, which we'll get there. They were going to be drawn to his eloquence and his wisdom. And so a little bit here on, um, and this was touched on in Sunday school, I believe it was Laverne maybe, a little bit on giving uh, people in the, or presenting the gospel, uh, giving people what they want to hear. You know, we all love to hear the parts of the gospel that are true, but that that do something for us, God's love, his mercy, his, and you could start naming all that are, that are just, we should be appreciative of these things. I'm not, don't get me at all wrong here. We should be very, it's, it's all part of the package. But one point I want to make here is, is just focusing on, on parts of the gospel that make us feel good um, is not the whole gospel. And if you ever took note how Jesus dealt with people, it's very eye-opening sometimes. There seemed to be times when he would almost try to discourage someone from being part of the kingdom. Um, and I don't, I don't want to take too much time on this. I jotted down a couple things. The rich young ruler is one I thought of. Um, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he's, Jesus said, keep the commandments. He's like, I've, I've done all this since I was young. And he's like, but Jesus, like we talked about in Sunday school, he knew, he knew more than, and so he, he knew the issues in this man's life. So he says, why don't you sell all you have and give to the poor? And I, I'm going to say that 
any one of us that Jesus would have said that to if, if you're rich. It said this, this man was very rich and he went away sorrowful. That's not what he wanted to hear. But Jesus went right after the thing that was, was holding him back. Um, that's just one I thought of. Uh, the guy that came to Jesus said, uh, I want to follow you wherever you go. And, you know, we would say, if it would be me, I would say, you know, good. You know, somebody on board with me, um, bless your heart. I just want to make you feel welcome. Um, Jesus didn't exactly do that. He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. The son of man, I, I don't have a house. I have nowhere to lay my head. Basically saying, um, are you sure? Do you, do you still want to come? Do you still want to follow me? And so that Jesus would use that occasionally. I thought of the one in Matthew 10 where I don't want to turn to it, but I forget what the, uh, what the setting is there, but they're talking, uh, well, I don't want to get it wrong, but they're talking, let me just flip there. Ten. If I can find it. Trying to find the context. Well, he, he's Jesus had a pretty long dialogue here. Anyway, he, he kind of he goes into this thing. Think not. Remember the think not. I'm I'm come I'm I'm come to bring peace on the earth. I'm not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, and then he goes to say, you know, members of, of families will be against each other, brother against sister, mother against um, father against their children. Basically, if you're going to be if you're if you're going to be choose this way it may well bring a separation when someone you are a believer and someone is not a believer um and you make a choice to follow me it's it, it's it's pretty radical it's it may bring a separation so i'm just trying to highlight jesus he didn't give them all you know words that they wanted to hear it was some hard it was some hard sayings and I think that's the, um, I won't go into any more there, but the point, Paul's focus here was not just on um, things that, you know, ear-tickling things that, that kind of make you feel good about yourself. Um, and I guess I'll, maybe I'll just say this, and that, that's kind of what, you know, some popular preachers would do today. And it's not untrue. That's the thing. The thing, the thing about um, parts of the gospel that I mentioned before, the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, it's all so very true and important, but we need to include the whole gospel. And maybe the temptation is tell people what they want to hear and leave out, leave out the truth about myself that I don't really want to hear. And so I don't think we I don't think we should do that. So God help us to preach the whole gospel. Don't leave out the uncomfortable truth of the gospel that cut right to the heart of the matter that the gospel wants to confront us or Jesus wants to confront us about ourselves. You know, don't bother, don't tell people they need to take up their cross and follow me. That's pretty radical. Or maybe dying to self. Maybe we shouldn't tell them too much that they need to die to self. Or talk about loving your enemies or being willing to suffer for the name of Christ. You see what I'm saying? That's also part of the gospel and true so verse 4 going to verse 4 you know I, I looked at this it does not really seem like a description of Paul 
as I think about Paul, bold, ready to confront the issues. I'll read it again. My speech was not, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. No, I'm sorry. I wanted verse three. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That's the part that I that I looked at. And I'm thinking, well, there's you know, there's a lot of a lot of places in Acts where it states how bold Paul was, Paul and Silas. Um, <clears throat> uh, numerous places in Acts. I jotted a few down. Um, but Paul, it, it's possible that Paul could have been not as he could have been naturally a more timid person, and you may take me to task on this, and, and, and we don't know. It's kind of speculation. But um, this sounds timid, and it sounds a bit intimidated, in, or like he was intimidated. Um, not a lot of confidence in himself. Uh, in Ephesians 6, Paul asked the Ephesians twice to pray for him that when he speaks that he would fearlessly proclaim the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So, you know, we can think sometimes, well, I'm not as bold as Paul was. I just, you know, I've, normally I'm a little more timid. And so, you know, it was easy for Paul to do, but I don't think it was entirely that way. Um, Numerous times in Acts, the Lord encourages Paul not to be afraid in the midst of opposition and conflict. And so I think the boldness, Paul had to, um, he asked the Ephesian Christians, pray for me that I would, I would have this boldness. So the idea that Paul was just naturally a bold person may not be exactly how it was. You know, in 2 Corinthians, there was some chatter floating around the Corinthian community that Paul, his letters were very weighty and forceful. But in person, what did they say? How, how was he in person? Um, that's in 2 Corinthians 10. He was unimpressive. He was unimpressive and his speech amounted to nothing. That's, that's the things that were floating around. In, and he, he, especially, he especially says that in the, in the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Um, so talk about, talk about a little bit of a confidence uh, crusher, maybe. Like if you, if you all were sitting here and, and you... You're going to get up front and speak like I am. And you, you knew that people thought, well, you could write a really nice letter. But when you got up in front of people and had to face them, that you were pretty unimpressive. How, what would that do to your confidence? Well, there goes Joe. I guess I'll just take a nap. <laughs> pretty unimpressive. Not very eloquent. eloquent. So, destroy your confidence, um, which is another thing I'd like to talk about a little bit. Confidence. Somebody, James, I think it was in prayer. I was thinking about the word confidence, and you, you prayed, used that word in your prayer, so I, I caught it. You know, let, let's, use, let's use our business dealings. If you go out and buy a product or you're, some of your businessmen, you know, you want to be, be pretty confident about your product. You want to be I don't really want to buy, buy something from someone that's uh, really timid about, not quite sure, he's not quite sure about this, about his product, and he, he's not sure it'll work. And, you know, I would, I would back off pretty quick. Like, I don't know, this guy don't not very confident in what, he, what he's selling. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's a good thing. And I'm, I'm going to hear me out. 
try to put this in perspective. So the co that kind of confidence. Now, now there is this, the thing of arrogance. Um, I won't get into that, but I think it's a good thing when you're familiar with, you know, what you do day to day, um, dealing with people, be confident. Um, I'm going to give you a little warning here to myself and to you all. The word confidence comes from a Latin word, and it means to trust. Basically, trust in your product, what you're selling. Trust it. You know, I, if I look at a, a, you know, what I do, I, I build, I could look at a, a blueprint, and I could, I have pretty much confidence. I think I can build that. I think I can build it like they want it built. Um, the more you are the same here, the, the daily work that you do, the confidence, you're familiar with it. Uh, familiarity brings confidence. Um, that's not wrong. But trusting, let's say, self-confident. And, and that's sort of what I'm, what I'm talking about. But self-confidence means you are trusting in yourself and your abilities. Okay. In this passage, we see Paul lacks, in verse 3, it really looks like he lacks confidence in himself, very much so. So in Philippians 3, Paul talks about boasting in the Lord, but putting no confidence in his flesh. And then he even goes on to say, although I would have reasons for such confidence. And then he kind of goes over his pedigree and says, I could be pretty confident in that, in that, but I'm going to put my confidence and my trust in the Lord and not in myself. So the Bible has many verses about putting your trust and your confidence in God and not in yourself. Proverbs, the Lord shall be your confidence. Uh, Psalms, some trust in horses, some in chariots. We'll trust in the name of the Lord. So I don't believe we need to walk around. I don't believe we need to walk around being uh, timid or unsure of ourselves, feeling inferior. Um, we can be confident, but let our confidence be rooted in Christ, in God. Recognizing that all the abilities all the talents, whatever you can accomplish, the skills that he has given you ultimately come from him and he's the sustainer of your life. And at any time, he could take any of these things away. So that'll give you, you know, that, that'll help you to see, okay, my confidence, my trust is in God. Not, you know, he's given me these things and I want to use him but I'm not going to put confidence. I'm not going to put trust in myself. And I believe that that is what the Bible is, is calling us to. You know, the devil, the devil wants us to either be very confident, sort of arrogant, possibly, or the other extreme is just to be really inferior. And you can't, no, I can't do that. I can't, no, I never could do that right. And somebody asks you to, to you know speak in public or what no i i can't do that or i can't you know you're just inferior everywhere you know the devil got either on the proud arrogant self-confident side yeah i can i'm the guy or oh i can't do i can't do anything i can't do this i can't do that so you know what in both cases what's the problem you're looking at yourself and not at god and so let's put our, the focus, our focus on God. If he gives you gifts, talents, walk in them with confidence, knowing that he is the author of them. Uh, here, one thing I wanted to bring out here it, that ties in with this thought. One reason we should not put or one thing that comes our way that teaches us not to trust in ourselves, and that, that's in the second letter to the Corinthians, 
chapter 1. Second Corinthians 1. Okay, it's down in verse 8. Saying, brethren, Paul wrote to them again, I just want to let you know something. I don't want you to be ignorant of the trouble that we had when we were in Asia. He says, I was pressed out of measure. Have you ever been pressed out of measure? I was, felt like I was squashed. Um, above my level of strength, that's paraphrasing, out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Verse 9, it says I had the sentence of death. It felt like I had a death sentence hanging over me. So why, why is he saying all this? Or why am I saying it? The, the last part of verse 9. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not, it taught him, we should not trust in ourselves. So trials, he's, he's highlighting all the trials he had while he was in Asia. And then he's saying, this is teaching me not to trust in myself, but in God who raiseth the dead. Okay, so that's raising the dead is, we had that in our Sunday school lesson. That's, that's a miracle. So we're trusting in God who can do things, he can do above what we ask or think not trusting in ourselves. So I just thought I'd bring that out also when we're talking about trust, self-confidence, and trust in ourselves. <clears throat> so verse 5, down to verse 5, and I think this is a clincher here. The reason Paul gave as to why he did not come to them with persuasive arguments and words of man's wisdom, it's so that your faith, and I probably already mentioned or alluded to this that your faith might not rest on human wisdom and this kind of sums up this whole wisdom talk from chapter one into chapter two not rest on human wisdom but on god's power okay that's why he didn't come with um, persuasive arguments and eloquence and words of man's wisdom so what you draw people with is what you draw them to. You know, as humans, it, it's, it's, it's a temptation for us to be impressed with people and with eloquent people and with brilliant thinking. Um, but think back to that that verse in James, true uh, wisdom from above, it's not just brilliant ideas and brilliant thoughts, and it comes with actions, a good conversation, a good life, and deeds done in, good deeds done in love. I, now, he doesn't say love. I don't have that right in front of me, but my point is, it's more than just a static thought. It's a dynamic um, thing, an action. You know, how many times have you went from church, or I went from church and said, well, he wasn't, he wasn't that great today. He wasn't that eloquent. You know, we're, we're drawn, we're drawn to, to eloquence. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, as someone that stands up front, you should be lazy and you should not study the word and you should not come up with a cohesive um, message. But what are we drawn to? Now, I don't know. I was supposed to make a couple of points well. <laughs> and I tried. And so let me recap here a little bit. And I think we're going to stop right there in verse 5. And I'll, next time I'll just, I'll take the, I believe I'll take the, 
the rest of the chapter. And now notice it switches a little. I'll just, I will touch on this. So you don't throw all wisdom and knowledge out. How be it, verse 6, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. That means mature. Oh, so, yeah, Paul's not saying we're just pitching wisdom. He's making a distinction, and here it is again. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. So can you see the, the difference? That was one of my points. Two kinds of wisdom. We have wisdom from above, and we have man's wisdom. So that's a point um, to remember. Wisdom is an understanding heart to discern, discern between good and evil. Paul chose to make his message all about Christ and the cross. Even though it was most likely an offensive message to the people that he was communicating with. Paul's confidence was not in himself, but in God. That raises the dead. And so that's, um, that's verses 1 to 5. And I didn't even touch on, I don't even have it written down, but I noticed, I just bring this to your attention, yeah, you can think about it. But in the power of God. There's, there's, I think, at least three times. Maybe I can touch on that. Maybe I can touch on that next time. I think it's, it talks about the power of God. I think it's, a, I think it's about three times. But I'll, I'll let that. All right, wrapping up. Um, are there any thoughts, questions, or, or anything you want to say yet before we uh, dismiss? I'll give a little opportunity for that. If you have something, if not. All right. Thank you all for coming today. God bless each one. Why don't you all rise while we dismissal prayer? Joe, do you want to dismiss us with?